Hello everyone. I hope you're doing good and you are enjoying our sessions. If yes, please do like them and do subscribe. So today what we will do is we will talk about some call flows. Now call flows they are they sound they sound boring, they sound difficult. Um, we can refer to 3GPP and we know that the call flows in 3GPP are difficult to understand. But what I've done here is that I have tried to simplify them and make them interesting for you. I've also added some uh, actual UE logs to see how the call flows actually looks like inside the inside the UE logs. So let's start with the 5G network entry call flow. And before that, uh, I think we need to have a bit of a background. So as I explained in uh, my 5G architecture video, uh, currently most of the networks are using the non-standalone approach. What does that mean? That means that the users right now cannot directly connect to 5G. In most of the networks, they will connect to LTE first and then the LTE node will add the 5G leg. So in that case, consider this scenario where we have an LTE plus 5G side. Now LTE is a mature network. It has carpet coverage in most of the countries. So what will happen is that LTE will have a bigger coverage let's say the blue circle over here, it shows the LTE coverage. While the 5G is mostly being added as a capacity layer, so it will have lesser coverage, but of course it will have more capacity. So let's say this green circle indicates the 5G coverage. Now if I have four users, these orange handsets, and that are all 5G capable, one of the things that the LTE anchor node can do is that it can check if the user is 5G capable, it can try to give them 5G service. But what will happen here is that these users, which are within the 5G coverage, they will be happy because they are getting 5G service. But these users, which are outside the 5G coverage, but within the LTE coverage, they might not be satisfied because they will not get good 5G service. So uh, what is the ideal way to do that? The ideal way to do that is to tell the LTE node a threshold. Let's say this is our threshold. So what it will do is that it will ask each of these users, are you above this threshold? If yes, then these users will get 5G service. If you are below this threshold, then you stay on LTE and you don't try to attempt to get to 5G. In that case, all of the users will get some considerable amount of service. Now, what is this threshold called? This threshold is called 5G B1 threshold. It's a very important threshold as it is one of the thresholds that sets our 5G coverage. And also all our 5G KPIs can also be dependent on this. So now let's go into the call flows and understand how this works out. Now let's see, we have a 5G device, we have a 4G LTE site, and we have a 5G NR site, the G node B, okay? Now, as I explained before, uh, a 5G device in a non-standalone network cannot connect to the 5G net G node directly. It needs to go through the LTE node. So let's say this 5G device is connected to the LTE node. LTE node knows that this is a 5G capable device. So it will ask the 5G device to connect to the 5G node. But before that, it needs to verify that this 5G device is within the coverage of this 5G node. How does it do that? It does that by sending an RRC reconfiguration message. This message, it carries the frequency of this 5G node and it also carries the, the B1 threshold. So let's see how it actually looks like. This is uh, from an actual UE log. So we can see here that we sent a measurement object NR, which is the 5G new radio, R15. This one is the frequency of the SSB of that 5G node. Now, if you remember, I explained what, what SSB is um, in my uh, 5G frame structure video. So what it does is that this is the SSB, which carries the PSS, the primary sync signal, the SSS, the secondary sync signal, and the MIB, the master information block or the PBCH, the physical broadcast channel. So this one is uh, the frequency of the SSB. So over here, it is asking the user that this is the frequency 
this is the subcarrier spacing bit for use for this frequency and over here this is the B1 threshold now B1 threshold of 56 means minus 100 dBm why because the formula to calculate that is whatever the value is here you subtract 156 from it this is this is also defined in 3GPP so if we do that 56 minus 156 that means minus 100 dBm so if the user can see the 5G RSRP above minus 100 then it will say that I am within the 5G coverage if it says that it is below minus 100 then it will say that it is uh, not inside the 5G coverage and it will stay on LTE so this is the first thing that uh, the LTE E node B will ask the 5G device to do then the 5G device will send an RRC reconfiguration complete that's an acknowledgement message saying that okay whatever you sent me I acknowledge that I will start doing that and then it will need to measure the RSRP of this 5G frequency that was shared to it now RSRP is the same as LTE reference signal receive power and this is a sort of the measurement of signal strength so if as we as we discussed that the threshold here was minus 100 so if it measures the RSRP and let's say it is below minus 100 that means the UE will not send anything to the E node B and the E node B will not add the 5G leg because the UE is not in the 5G coverage but if the UE finds out that the RSRP or the signal strength is above minus 100 then the UE sends a B1 measurement report to the LTE E node B let's see what this contains so this one is an actual B1 measurement report uh, the important part here is this one measurement result cell NR because we're looking for 5G NR this is the important part so the UE says that it measured PCI 127 and it found out that the RSRP was 76 now again what we will do is that we will do 76 minus 156 that's around minus 80 which is above minus 100 so we can say that okay uh, the UE is within 5G coverage and that's why it sent a B1 measurement report now when the E node B gets the B1 measurement report now it knows that the UE is within 5G coverage so it will try to add the 5G leg for this UE how can it do it will send a message on X2 towards the 5G node which is the S G node B addition request for this UE now the G node B will get this message and it will say okay now I have a 5G setup attempt and it will pack that with one of its KPIs here that okay I got one 5G setup attempt and if the G node B can process this this attempt or this request it will send an S G node B addition request acknowledgement now this message carries all the configuration of the G node B side so everything that G node B has uh, all the configuration like RACH configuration, its frequency configuration, its power, its PDSCH, its PDCCH configurations, all of that will be here. Now the E node B needs to send this over to the 5G device because the 5G device cannot have any control signaling with the, the 5G G, G node B. So the only process, uh, the only pathway would be that the G node B sends all the data all the configuration uh, to the LTE E node B and the LTE E node B then sends that over the air in the RRC reconfiguration to the 5G device so let's have a look what is inside this one so this is just a small snapshot of this one because this message is very very big it carries all the configuration but the important one here let's say it sends the physical cell ID if you remember the measurement report also had a PCI which was 127 so it says this is the PCI the same PCI that the UE measured and the frequency of the SSB this is the same as well which was sent in the measurement control and this one also sends the frequency point A which is the frequency of the start of the channel so now this frequency of SSB it can be anywhere within the channel so we need to know the where the channel the 5g channel frequency starts so this one gives us the the lower edge of the start of the channel and this one gives us the carrier bandwidth so 273 it means 100 
megahertz. If you remember, I explained this in the 5G throughput estimation video that 273 actually equates to 100 megahertz. How does it happen? Because 273 is actually 273 resource blocks and in 100 megahertz channel with 30 kilohertz uh, subcarrier spacing we have uh, 273 resource blocks. So now it knows the frequency on the lower edge plus the bandwidth so it knows the total bandwidth of the channel and where it is located in the frequency domain. So this is how it finds that out and over here we have the subcarrier spacing which is 30 kilohertz and when you have 30 kilohertz subcarrier spacing that means you will have a slot length of uh, 0.5 milliseconds and symbol duration of 35 microseconds. All of that I explained um, in my previous video uh, about 5G frame uh, frequency and time domain structure. So once you have all of that, the UE now knows where the whole channel of the 5G is. Also, this one also carries all the RAC information. So the UE can know how to do the random access. Now, what happens after that? After this, the UE will send an RFC reconfiguration complete which is the response to this message saying that whatever the configuration the E node be sent to the, the to the handset it is compatible and it can uh, it can use that configuration to connect to 5G once the E node B gets that it sends the message over X2 again towards the 5G G node saying S G node B reconfiguration complete this shows that it was a successful 5G setup now important thing to understand here up till now uh, all the messaging from the UE towards the 5G are going to, through LTE. So the UE is sending the message to LTE and LTE is forwarding it to the 5G G node B. There is no direct communication between LTE, between the 5G G node B and the 5G UE up till now. So after this, uh, the first message that the UE sends now is the 5G preamble, the random access preamble and it gets this information to generate this message from this RFC reconfiguration which the G node B had shared with the UE. Now this is the first message which is sent from the UE towards the 5G G node B. This is where the RACH attempt is pegged. Another interesting thing here, in LTE the RACH is the first thing that the UE does, right? The UE when it needs to connect to an LTE node it sends the RACH preamble, right? But in 5G uh, non standalone it is a bit different so you can see that the 5G setup has already completed and then the RACH comes so this is the difference because we have a non standalone approach if we have a standalone approach then again the RACH will be the first message uh, that the UE sends to the 5G G node B so in non standalone the RACH message comes after all of the 5G setup is done now based on this RACH the G node B will send a message to which is a random access response. This one will um, carry the timing advance as well. So the UE will get the timing advance and it can adjust its timing ad timing uh, offset and send the message three. Once the G node B gets the message three, it pegs it as a rash success. And we say that the UE is now connected to 5G successfully. So this is how uh, the call flow looks like. Um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that this was easy for you. Um, it was simple and you understand now each step uh, it's more like a story so you can now understand each step how the 5G device moves from LTE towards 5G node and how it gets serviced. So after this the 5G device is connected and the data will start flowing from the 5G node to the 5G device. So hopefully uh, it was good for it was helpful if it was please subscribe and uh, there are more videos coming so stay tuned. Thank you so much.